There was like no discussions. Uh, one scholar wrote it was really hot. It was July and the windows were closed and they were getting bored. Go figure. All right, now let's just think about what disestablishmentarianism is, right? A state with no established religion. All right, disestablish, there's no established religion. All right, I want to draw out a very important nuance which often my students stumble on in a minute accommodationism. This is the future, and I'm not delighted about it, but this is where I think we're all going. We'll call it the American model. Accommodationists argue that the government may aid religion as long as it does not do so to the advantage of one religion over another. Aid must be given in a non-preferential manner. What is available to one religion must be available to all. So the government accommodates. This is very funny. Melvin Yurofsky, he goes to my synagogue. Isn't that funny? I met him at my synagogue. Right? So here you have two secular Jewish guys who are both non-believers in the same synagogue. I didn't know. I found that very ironic, right? You don't have to be a professor of literature, which I technically am, right, to, to enjoy the irony of that one. Um, so accommodationism, a couple of good things about it and a couple of bad things about it. What's good about accommodationism? I know Canada is very kind of earnestly grappling with multiculturalism. What's really good is a government that says, let's imagine each one of these um, uh, folks represents a religion. Five dollars to this religion, five dollars to this religion, five dollars. That's right, right? So the Buddhist gets five, the Jews get five, the Anglicans get five, the Catholic, everyone's happy. What could be bad about that? A couple of things could be bad about that, all right? The first thing that could be bad about that is what if this citizen doesn't believe in anything? She gets nothing, all right? There's no five dollars for her, all right? That's the first major problem with accommodationism. It seems to privilege belief over non-belief. Second problem with accommodationism, I'm going to use my, I'm allowed one curse, I was told by Professor Shipley, right? Um, <laughs> what do you do with the batshit crazy groups in the United States, right? What do you do with the white supremacists, right? What do you do with the infanticide groups, right? If there are any shakers around, what do you do with them? The shakers are, are gone, right? So accommodationism has this sort of pie-in-the-sky view of religion as a good, and any sophisticated scholar of religion understands sometimes religions do terrible things. Sometimes they do great things, sometimes they don't, right? So accommodationism has these two sort of nasty edges to it, right? But um, never fear, folks, this is the policy of the land. Uh, George W. Bush, his very first executive action when he took office, the first thing he did is he established the much maligned and hated Office of Faith-Based Initiatives. And in 2008, Barack Obama, it was July 2nd, it was in Zanesville, Ohio, he was giving a big press conference on the Office of Faith-Based Initiatives. This is a Democrat. Everyone thought he was going to say, we're getting rid of it. All right, we're going to kick it out. He said, we're going to supersize it. We're going to make it even bigger when I'm elected president. All right, so accommodationism really is, in the American theater, the way of thinking about things, much to the chagrin of non-believers. All right, let's just move a little bit forward. We're almost done. Here's our First Amendment again. So the distinction I like to draw for my students, right, is, there's the whole First Amendment, is that disestablishmentarianism and separation of church and state are not the same thing. Because you can have an accommodationist disestablishmentarian regime, such as we have, there's no official religion in the United States, but we accommodate, so there's no separation. Then you have brilliant Supreme Court judges like William O. Douglas who say it's impossible to separate religion, uh, and church and state anyhow, right? If there's a fire at a church, this is from the United States Supreme Court, is the fire department supposed to not go to put out the fire, right? Because it's happening on religious grounds, right? And I believe this gets very close to what was going on during the whole PQ uh, moment here, right? I seem to recall something about a huge cross in the parliament, right? And you have the PQ guys saying, it's just culture, it's just culture. It doesn't indicate any preference for Christianity. And critics of the PQ party were saying, no, right? There's an implicit thumbs up, right? Or approval of a majoritarian Catholicism. But I know these things are complicated. I don't want to be that American that meddles in your internal affairs. I guess, right? I understand, right? So hand to mouth, as it says in the book of Proverbs. All right, back we go. Separation, everyone. This is the great separations track. The great Thomas Jefferson, Mr. Jefferson. Boy, do these words boom out, right? This is the professor of literature speaking. 
believing with you that religion is a matter which lies solely between man and his God, blah, 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 blah. I contemplate with solemn reverence that act of the whole American people which declared their legislator, legislator would make no law respecting establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise. Watch for it, watch. Thus building a wall of separation between church and state. Everyone see what he did there? Let's go back, if you will. Okay, can somebody show me where the term separation of church and state is present in the United States First Amendment? Anybody? Anybody see it? No, it's not there. And a lot of very good conservative Christian historians have said, what the hell was Jefferson talking about, right? There's nothing in there about separation of church and state. There's a lot of scholarship on this private letter he wrote to the Danbury Baptists. I'm happy to give it to you after the lecture. But I think they have a, a reasonable point that the United States Constitution doesn't make any provisions for separation of church and state. Oh yeah, remember I told you Mr. Madison wrote a draft he really cared about, right? And it never made it to the floor. This was it. All right? This is what he wanted the First Amendment to be. Isn't that funny? Look how different that is from anything else. And everybody said no. We don't quite know why they said no, right? But it never. They never made it, right? This would have been a lot better if you asked me. I could have gone uh, with this one. Okay, non-cognizance, very quickly. I'm trying to give my Canadian colleagues some things to think about, right? Non-cognizance is a state that takes no notice whatsoever of religion, all right? Just as if religion doesn't exist, all right? How do you do that? I don't know, all right? So this is James Madison. I'm going to put up Professor Munoz in a second of Notre Dame wrote a very fine and well-known article. This is, by non-cognizance, Madison means that the state may not recognize or acknowledge the religious affiliation of individual citizens. Literally, the state may not take religion into its view. I don't know how you do that, but that was Mr. Madison's idea. Laïcité. Okay, now we're back in Quebec. Everyone ready? All right. La France est une république indivisible, laïque, démocratique et sociale. Isn't that beautiful? All right. Indivisible. Really important, right? Secular democratic and social, you're seeing, for the folks from Quebec here, you're seeing a lot of your DNA, right, uh, rise to the fore. Uh, laïcité is not like American separation of church and state. I'm going to make it very easy for you. I'm going to give you the scholarly consensus. This is Olivier Roy, uh, a very talented French political scientist who really broke it down in a book called France and Islam, I believe. What's it called? Yeah, Secularism Confronts Islam. I've never seen somebody with such concision tell us what laïcité is. Laïcité is, above all, an obsession with religion, and it leads to the desire to legislate about religion instead of accepting true separation. Bingo! All right. As you can tell from my first name, I have French roots. I spent a lot of time in France. That's exactly the old laic mentality, right? We control religion. That's what we do. Because it's disorderly, by the way, right? This comes right out of the Declaration of the Rights of Man, right? So it's a parallel track, the Anglo and the Franco understandings of secularism, but they're different from one another. All right, have we gone through all of our definitions? We have. So we'll put up the final screen. I'll make uh, a few final remarks, and then we'll get to the robust Q&A. In conclusion, what have we learned? We've learned that secularism is a very complicated political doctrine, born of Christian political thought. We've learned that it's really inaccurate to associate secularism with atheism. I don't know if you guys do it out here in Canada as much as it happens in the United States. Uh, we've learned that it's very inaccurate to say, as Charles Taylor sometimes says, that secularism is the same thing as separationism. Uh, I would certainly wouldn't say that. There are other forms of separationism. We've looked at accommodationism, which I've argued to you guys is a flawed model, but a model with tremendous momentum. And you'll tell me in the Q&A if it's coming to a um, federated part of Canada near us anytime soon. All right. And we've also learned that the secular tradition is in flux, poorly understood, and under attack, and it really, really is. So I'm going to give you a kind of stump speech as we wind on down. Why do we need to be secular? I'll make it very simple for you. One, because it protects religious minorities, most importantly. That's the single greatest deliverable of the secular vision. This is what Mr. Locke had in mind. It protects the religiously vulnerable. 
Two, it militates against religious establishments, and nobody likes a religious establishment that's not their own. Unless there's somebody in this room that does, all right? If there's a Baptist in this room that says, well, I just love it, love it, right? When uh, I'm ruled by uh, Sharia law, I, I've never met that Baptist, right? Nobody wants to be in that predicament, and vice versa. Three, it assures freedom of speech and conscience. And four, most importantly, it insists that no person will ever be subject to somebody else's conception of God. Finally, following Marsilius and Luther, one of the greatest benefits it offers is order. Order, order, order. So as I look at the United States, with its awful, awful tradition of racial division and racial oppression, I said, well, we never had a First Amendment for race in the country. Right? We never thought about the problematic, and look what it wrought. However, the United States is a beacon unto other nations in terms of religious toleration. Again, I mean that quite seriously. We have tremendous racial violence and intolerance in our country. We have not had these problems with religion for a good 70, 80, 90 years. We can talk about Catholics in the 19th century and anti-Semitism towards Jews, but Jews, I assure you, have seen much worse. All right? My belief is that the reason why this is not an American dilemma, such as race, is is precisely because of the American secular tradition. So what I hope we can do in the Q&A is we can reflect on the Canadian theater and anything else uh, you good people who have listened to me now for a long time would like to discuss. Thank you very much.